All right. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Annie Oak. I'm going to talk today about community safety and mediation, creating safer containers, conflict resolution, and resilience. It's one of my favorite topics. So what do I do? I'm an artist. I'm not a therapist. I'm not a doctor. I come from another tradition. My lineage is the wise women tradition, the witch tradition, the shamaness tradition. Sometimes we work together with the medical people. Sometimes we work at odds with the medical people. Right now we're working together. It's a beautiful thing. Hasn't always been the case throughout history. So, I come from a lineage of wise women. I've been part of psychedelic communities since 1978. It's my community education, my bona fides, my credentials. I was part of the Deadhead community. I was part of the downtown Studio 54 punk communities in New York City in the late 70s, early 80s part of the EDM and raver communities. Part of those communities. I started going to this event in 1996. This is my 24th consecutive year out here. <laughs> yes. So throughout this long, beautiful journey, as a member of psychedelic communities and as a member of my own lineage, I've had the pleasure of working with some really wonderful people, and we've gathered what I think is some very useful knowledge that I'm going to share with you today. And here are some of the projects I've been part of. I'm trained as a journalist. I'm a science reporter by training. I started covering the psychedelic community, movement, conferences, gatherings, and so on in the 90s, and I just couldn't help but notice there were hardly any women speaking. Like, where are all the women on the lineup? I know a ton of psychedelic women. We all hang out. <laughs> but they weren't on the lineup. So, you know, my attitude is if you want to change the world, throw a better party, right? So, instead of complaining about how there were no women on the lineup, I decided to start an event and became an event producer. I've been producing small events since the early 80s. In 2007, I threw an event called the Women's Visionary Congress. And what we did is we just inverted what was happening in the psychedelic community where there were almost all men and just a few women. We did all women and just a few men. And included people of all genders, trans people, etc. So in 2007, we invited, I invited a group of psychedelic women. I worked with the group who threw the event. A hundred people showed up. It was an amazing experience. Psychedelic women stood in their power. Researchers, artists, activists, and healers, and shared their knowledge. Instead of us just having to caucus together in hotel hallways and complain about why there were no women on the lineup. It was awesome. In 2008, we realized that we needed to start a nonprofit to keep this going, and so we did. 2008, we formed the Women's Visionary Council. I asked two senior psychedelic women elders to join with me, and we formed a nonprofit in 2008. And uh, around that time, I was helping MAPS as a volunteer in the sanctuary space that the rangers here were running. And um, it's a long story, but uh, we were asked to leave that space and, uh, and invited to become rangers. So I became a Burning Man ranger out here. And uh, um, the ranger culture, it was great training. I love the rangers. They serve a very important role. But they run two bars on the playa. And after your shift, you know, we would all drink. And alcohol is not my drug. I'm a psychedelic woman, right? So I was like, huh, 
What I really need to do is to create a space where people can lie on soft pillows and drink tea and hydrate and trip. <laughs> Instead of going to a bar and drinking alcohol on top of whatever else they're doing and getting dehydrated. So I decided to stop being a ranger and started a tea house. And in 2011, I started the Full Circle Tea House and Camp Soft Landing, which is the camp that serves the tea house. And that camp is still, eight years later, up and serving 24-7 at 8.30 and E. Woo! It's been taken over by a whole community of people. I do collaborative community art. I'm an artist, right? So, uh, five years ago or so, I gave up running the camp. I handed it off. We did a very rare thing. We did a succession plan for our camp. And instead of burning out and rage quitting and having the camp implode, which is usually what happens out here for long-standing camps, we did a succession plan. And we, I handed off the camp to a second generation of managers, and now we're on our third generation of managers. The tea house is now run by a collective in West Oakland. So a community has taken that over. A community runs the Women's Congress. I'm still on the board of the WVC, but that's also a community effort. In 2013, I had a very long walk on the playa with two friends of mine who were also running large camps. At this point, Camp Soft Landing is a camp of like 170 people. Oh my gosh, because we're serving 24-7. We need a big crew of people to do that. So, <clears throat> my friend, Chris Peza, who was running the Palenque Norte Speaker Series, which is also in our camp, and my friend Misha Steiner. We took a very long walk out on the playa one night, <clears throat> and we realized that we were all doing large-scale camp logistics. One of the reasons I love Burning Man is that I learned how to do large-scale production and camp logistics out here. I can build fuel depots, I can run a build crew, which I did for five years in all kinds of weather. We can put up structures like nobody's business. I built out here for a week this year. But we realized that we knew enough to do our own events because we were running big camps, all of us. And so we decided to get together and throw a party. And that's how Take Three started. And we, uh, we threw a party in 2013, and um, at the end of that party, we decided to form a company. And we've been now running for the past six years invitation-only, private, immersive art parties for six years. And that's been a marvelous thing, so we've learned a lot doing that. And in 2014, we started the WVC Risk Reduction Workshops. And um, WVC, I prefer the phrase risk reduction over harm reduction. I don't believe all use is harmful. I believe we should reduce risk. So the WVC, the Women's Visionary Council, runs these workshops where we teach the three basic drug skills, which we feel are the most important for risk reduction. How to use reagent testing kits, thank you, Dantsafe. How to use naloxone to prevent opioid overdose. Everyone should get trained. And how to correctly use a milligram scale so that you don't overdose yourself and your friends. Learn how to weigh your drugs. Seems reasonable. And because we're agreeable ladies, nobody pushes back on us, ever. Because we stand in our power we look after our community, and nobody hassles us, right? Yeah. So in 2018, after running Take Three events for five years, I realized we needed to do a new project. We needed to take on conflict in our community. We needed to take on conflict because conflict is a part of the human experience. And lot, there are lots of, you know, ideas about conflict and ethics. And uh, I had thought deeply about it, having been part of all these other psychedelic communities for a long time. And um, 
So I, together with some really beautiful people in our Take Three community, started a mediation service. And I want to talk about that, and I also want to talk about some of the things that we've learned. Some of the things I've learned personally producing events for many years, being a community leader, and being a risk reduction, a radical risk reduction activist. So let's talk about some of those things, shall we? Radical risk reduction, right. It's like radical self-reliance. <clears throat> Private versus public gatherings. The WVC runs public events, open to everybody, people of all genders, always. Take three events are private. You have to be invited by somebody. We like the private invitation because you're accountable to your sponsor. Somebody invites you to a Take Three event, they are responsible for you. You violate our community rules, there is accountability. Somebody, I run security for Take Three. I am the security director. And if somebody violates a community rule in our community, I can go to their sponsor and say, hey, what's up? The person you invited is violating our community rules. Help me out here. And they know that their ability to come back to our event is contingent on how well their friends behave, the people they invited. It's accountability. That helps a lot at private events. You can also modify it for public gatherings in some ways. Uh, but they both generate community standards, right? You can set some community rules, community standards for how you want your community to operate. When I design community systems, for communities, for events, I always assume limited resources. We run camps off landing on very limited resources. We don't have massive generators, we don't have a giant food service, we don't have cranes to put up buildings. It's really DIY, and I prefer it that way, because I believe in radical self-reliance. I believe everything we design should be replicable, inexpensive to reproduce, and it should always be that way. Assume limited resources. It should be sustainable, scalable, and adaptable for all communities. That's how I design things as an artist. Addressing safety risk in different environments. Our Take Three events, we hold them in hotels. We hold them as campouts in the middle of the woods. The tea house goes to many different kinds of events. Um, it should be adaptable. Um, when I started the tea house, it, the idea also was to provide a space for people to land, to receive compassionate support. You can sit at our tea table, you can talk to the tea servers, they'll hold energy for you, they'll hold your space. If you're in distress, we'll hydrate you, we'll give you water. What we try to do is catch people before they need to go to the Zendo, to catch them before that time. And Rick came over and looked at the tea house and he said, this is great, we should start something like a Zendo. And I'm like, you go do that, Rick. That's a great idea, I support you. And now we work together, which is a really beautiful thing. So I wanna say that the radical risk reduction systems that I design address community disputes, especially consent violations. It's great to talk about consent, but it's human nature that there will be consent violations of different forms, and so we address that as well. And we encourage personal and community resiliency. This talk is about resiliency. These are some ideas I wanna to share to make your community more resilient. Oh boy, wrong way. Okay. What is safety? The world is inherently unsafe, people. Everything I'm about to say does not presume perfectly controlled therapeutic environments. The vast majority of people will do psychedelics in recreational spaces where there are no controls. Let's be clear about that. I so support all the medicalization and therapeutic initiatives, but actually, I design systems for recreational spaces and recreational use, period. This is important. The vast majority of people will do psychedelics in these spaces. So the world is inherently unsafe. Most psychedelic experiences will take place in recreational settings. There is no universal standard or expectation of safety. Nope. Each community has a different culture of safety. There is not one psychedelic community. There are many. 
psychedelic communities, many. And each community has a different culture of safety and should be able to set their own culture and their own expectations, their own systems. Each person has a different tolerance for risk and discomfort. Boy, is that for sure, right? Personal responsibility and resilience. Be personally responsible, be resilient, take care of yourself. Creating community standards for safety and risk reduction is what we do. And we do it in a scalable and adaptable way. So, I want to talk about our, um, some things that we do at Take Three events to support radical risk reduction. Time check. One of the things we do at Take Three events is we run our own ranger team. As, since I was a ranger out here, I know how to ranger. I know how to run a ranger team. We've created our own ranger team. We recruit kind, calm, smart, compassionate people for our ranger crew. We do our own trainings. We do our own documentation. I learned a lot being a ranger out here. We try to leave behind the alcohol culture and the drama and the politics. We have our own ranger leads. We recruit people for our ranger crew. We patrol our events 24-7 in pairs like they do out here on the playa. We identify leaders in our community, ranger leads, rangers. We empower them and we build teams to support community safety. In addition to our ranger team, we work with the professional medic crew. We work with our GX out of LA who are awesome. And we uh, have our own crisis intervention team. We create a team out of trained therapists and people who have professional mental health training for a crisis intervention team for our events so that if something is happening at our events, we can deploy first our rangers and then our CIT, our crisis intervention team, also learned from the playa here, modeled on that. We also have our own version of the Zendo. We call it the Cozy. The only reason that we don't have the Zendo at our events is that we want to create our own culture. We're artists. We want to create our own safety culture. We have our own version of the Zendo. We train our own Zendo leads, our version of the Zendo leads in the Cozy. We want to be able to create it's a beautiful thing that the Zendo can go to other events, and I totally support that. I, have, I am honor all the Zendo knowledge, and I feel lucky. Thank you, Ryan and Sarah, for all of that. But we want to create our own culture. We want to do our own training. We want to create our own knowledge, because that way we can push our knowledge forward and then go to our Zendo friends and say, hey, we figured something out. We haven't just onboarded your system. We've created our own system. We've evolved it, we've learned something, and we can give you back some information, right? Right. So, we draft documents that set expectations for safety at our events. We have the sponsorship system, we have some golden rules, we have some art guidelines, we have media policies. We publish all this out to our private list. Take three events are not on social media. We don't publicize them. They're private events. We have our own Slack channels. We have our own social media systems. We've taken the whole community off social media. That was one non-negotiable demand that I had for being a partner. And I think it was a correct decision. Because it allows us to work on our own culture, right? Instead of working everything out on Facebook. Heaven help us. So we have community rangers. We have the Cozy, which is our quiet space, our Zendo. We have our safety teams, we have professional medics, we have rapid response counselors, our CIT team. We have participant onboarding, and we make it clear how to report safety issues at our events. You can walk up to a ranger and say, I have a safety issue. The rangers will either handle it or they'll go to a, a CIT person. We have on-site workshops about consent and legal rights. So at every one of our events, we do a know your rights training and we do a consent workshop. 
And we also bring in DanceSafe. Thank you, Mitch, wherever he is. I go personally to the people who run the venues that we rent our spaces from, hotel operators, venue operators, and I make a direct argument for DanceSafe. I just say, fentanyl is in the drug supply. We want to make sure that nobody overdoses on opioids during our event. I know we've all lost people in all of our communities to opioid overdose. We don't want that to happen here, don't you? Any questions? No questions. Of course not, right? So you just stand in your power, you represent your community. We have Dance Safe at every one of our events. And I'm willing to make that argument in front of a judge, absolutely, any day of the week. So we have all these services. Let's see if I can do this. Oh. Right. We also limit alcohol. We've removed it from our business model. Most event production people make their money on alcohol. We do not. I will not make money distributing an inferior drug to the people I love. Instead, we bring in the tea house, of course. We bring the full circle tea house to every single one of our events. We set it up as the community social space. We host drug safety workshops before our event and after we bring in Dance Safe on-site, on-demand drug testing, no questions asked, right? Dance safe, we bring them in. They set up in our events and they provide on-site testing of substances, right? Like Mitch just said, every single one of our events absolutely stand behind them. We'll defend them against anyone. And nobody has pushed back on that at any event that I have ever run. Um, I develop emergency plans for fire, law enforcement, and medical. I'm the contact with law enforcement for our production company. I've dealt with law enforcement a fair bit during my, during my years as an event producer. We often send in the women. Is there a little bit less threatening in a tense situation. Also our male allies too, of course. We have an on-site attorney at every one of our events. We seldom need to use them, but I have held off sheriff's deputies at the end of the gate all night because they didn't have a warrant. Just, just keep them on the other side of the gate, thank you. So we educate venue operators and we respect local communities. We respect the local communities where we have our events, we treat law enforcement with respect, we ask for respect back. As I said, we often send in the women to negotiate with law enforcement. It works like a charm. Men also, people of all genders. We also model and reward a culture of respect and kindness. Being mean is not cool in our culture. It's one thing I didn't like about the early Burning Man culture. It was kind of like it was hip to be mean. I don't think it's hip to be mean. I think it's cool to be kind, treat people with respect, right? So after putting these events together for uh, five years or so, these take three events, and doing consent training, consent training is great, but consent training is not enough. It's not enough. People are going to be in conflict. They're going to be consent violations. This is just human nature. Just because you're a psychedelic community doesn't mean they're not going to be consent violations or conflict or like we're just all human, right? That's just kind of who we are, what we do. Um, so it became really clear to me that we needed to create a mediation team. And this is my newest project as an artist is to create community-based mediation and conflict resolution systems. So first thing I did was I recruited some of the wisest, kindest, most thoughtful, respected people within my Take Three community. 
And I said, be on our mediation team. Work with us. People know who you are. They respect your judgment. We gender balanced it, although we're still looking for some trans people. Be our mediation team so that we can help resolve conflict in our community. And I recruited six people who are marvelous people, all highly respected. This is step one. In your community, each community will do this differently, but here is the model that we've done that which we're trying to export. Find the people in your community who are respected, who are wise. They don't have to be elders, they can be younger people, but they're respected, they're thoughtful, they're fair, they're balanced. Find those people, create a team, ask them to volunteer for this team to help you develop protocols for dealing with conflict. That's what we did. We pay these people. This is work. My next project is raising money to pay these people to do this work in other communities. Respect your mediators. The problem that a lot of communities make, or the, the mistake, I should say, is they recruit mediators and then they ask them to be case managers in addition to mediators. There's a difference, which I'll get into in the future. Treat your mediators like a precious resource. They are a precious, precious resource. Don't burn them out. Pay them if you can. We pay ours. So we reviewed outside ideas for how to run a mediation team. There are lots of ideas out there. We developed our own set of protocols, which uh, we wrote down, which I would be happy to send you. If you want to email me, I have my contact info at the end. We reviewed outside ideas, we created our own protocols, we published them to our community. We said, these are our protocols for which we're going to handle conflict. What do you think? And we asked for feedback. Transparency, right? Credibility. We defined our community values of consent and respect. We're a community that wants to uphold consent, but we say in our communities, every yes it needs to be a hell yes, a no requires no qualification or explanation, right? It's pretty simple. Community values of respect, we respect each other. We treat each other respectfully, be kind, be respectful. Okay.
of what will mediate. Here are some things that we will mediate. We'll mediate consent violations. We'll mediate conflict between people. We will not mediate people's relationship unless it directly impacts the safety of our event. That's important because remember, most people don't have access to mental health services. They will try to use your limited resources to solve their personal problems so you have a sense of clear boundaries. Does that make sense? Determine what we will mediate and what we will define scope and actionable concerns. We mediate on site. And we also mediate with our mediation team, which we now call SIT, Safety Incident. We mediate your battle. Our mediation team is mediating a community of about 10,000 people year round. Banishment is a really strong response. 
response. Tribal groups have used banishment for centuries, for millennials, many years, as a way of saying, you have transgressed our community boundaries, Yeah. 
building on the Deep Rift project, we're all part of the same community. We're all friends. We talk all the time. We support each other. This is really why we So I want to talk, I want to wrap up this conversation with some challenges that we've encountered in exporting these ideas. It's very easy to say, oh, these ideas are great. They work for us. They work for you. Now we're trying to export the idea of a mediation team that we've used in take free events to the WBC. The Women's Visionary Congress needs their own mediation team. And, and it's been a beautiful thing to see the kind of resistance sometimes that comes up when you try to export new things to an idea, right? It teaches you more about your ideas. are some challenges that we've encountered trying to export the idea of community mediation teams. And I want to emphasize here that our protocols that we use, we share with other people, but each community needs to develop their own protocols, their own mediation teams that reflects their own community culture. So what kind of barriers stand in the way of that? Right? What things have we encountered that make us say, oh, that's a little harder than we think. So, number one, the time required to create protocols and form teams. You have to go out and group your meetings, right? It's not an easy thing. It's a personal commitment. People are afraid sometimes of being targeted as mediators, like on social media, so whatever. You have to recruit wise, brave people who are willing to serve like you. And also you need to create your own protocols. You need to maybe read our protocols or somebody else's mediation protocols. Determine your own protocols. And then you need to publish them to your own community so that you can get by. Right? So that you can be transparent and that your community can say, okay, if you like these protocols, we will abide by these protocols. This is a transparent process. Another problem is basic aversion to addressing conflict. And I think this is sometimes especially difficult for women. Because many women are socialized to just avoid conflict. Just avoid conflict. Just redirect. Okay? Not address conflict. And so you have to bring people along to the idea of addressing conflict. They'll say, yeah, I don't like that person. I don't like that person, but I don't want to attach my name to how I feel. I just want to banish them from our bed. It's called doxing. Does everyone here know what doxing is? Doxing is, I don't like you. I'm not going to talk with you about what I don't like about you. Because I don't want to reveal who I am. I don't want to reveal my beefs with you. I'm afraid you're going to slag me on social media. Whatever. I just want you to be gone. Work. Just walk. And I want to do it anonymous. I think that lacks courage, frankly. And I don't think it offers due process. I understand the legal worries and the fear of exposure, but I think everyone has a right to a process. And people who've been accused of things that violate community standards have a right read a complaint about them or hear a complaint about them and apply. They have a right to work this. They have a right to a process. They believe in this. They really do. We process and do process. That each community creates for themselves. And then there's resistance from existing leadership. The uh, WBC is run by the board, like all nonprofits. And so if you have a board process where it's a majority vote, it could be challenging to get this idea of past forward. It's not easy. Um, and then there is lack of community credibility. Um, you know, your community is like, oh, we don't trust the people who put on your mediation team. You don't have any credibility with us. We're not going to apply by your decision. We need to build credibility for this mediation team. We need to stand behind them. We need to say these are the kindest, most 
thoughtful, fairest people in our community. They're responding to conflict, hearing both parties. Give them a chance. Give them a chance. Give them a chance. You've got a great space for them. You can back them up. So, what happens without what happens when, when there's no team in place to do this? What happens? Well, it's mostly the default, right? There's impunity for people who commit consent violations. Nothing happens. Consent violation occurs and nothing happens. Impunity. In my day job, I work for a human rights organization. We fight against impunity. Right to respect, to be respected, to have one's consent respected. It's a human right. It's a human rights issue. So to uphold the human rights of your own community, we need to fight against impunity. Do something. Right? And also, without a conflict resolution system, there's no protection or justice for people who are violated. They're harmed, violated injured, they have to then carry that around with them. There is no system to recognize what happened to them, to give them a voice, to have a process. And there's no education or evolution for those who disrespect others, right? There's no feedback. The sit or the mediators can't go to them and say, you did this, this was wrong, you hurt somebody. Learn from it. Get some counseling. Help me find a professional counselor. Learn from this. Evolve. Evolve. Give people that opportunity. Worst thing that someone does is not who they are. Right? And then, of course, they're shunning, doxing, lack of process and opportunity. It's just gone. We're just going to anonymously kick you out of our event. We don't care. That reflects badly on the Process. It damages communities not to address conflict, but at the risk of explosion. Conflict destroys communities. We have to address it in order to build real community resiliency. Real resiliency looks at conflict, addresses it, acts a process, helps people evolve, supports people who have been violated, gets everyone professional care. Builds resilience within the community. Does that make sense? And if you don't do this, not only is there lack of community resilience, you are much more likely to have somebody from your community go to law enforcement outside of your community and say, I wasn't treated fairly. This community is no good. I can blow back on you within your community, especially secondary communities. People are vulnerable because they're using substances. So if you handle conflict within your own community, not only are you more resilient, you reduce the risk of outside pressures coming into your community and saying, this bad thing happened. We're going to handle this for you.
PowerPoints are very well defined bullet points, but each bullet point was like a whole subject of things that had to be done. So what is your best way of going about organizing each of those pieces and getting the ball rolling on that? Um, by emailing me and I'll send you a, a link to a Google Doc with our whole protocol written out on it. How's Lo that? I love that. <laughs> if you email me, I'll send you that. Will do. Thank you. And then you can just go point by point by point and adapt. Remember, adapt for your own culture. Ne next question. Questions? OK, then. I want to thank you all for your attention. If you'd like to support this effort, please feel free to get in touch with me. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Annie. And thank you, MAPS, for this amazing thing.